is Paul was a human being, right? And so certainly Paul made some choices that didn't line up exactly with what God would have. Um, God still used him and used even those difficulties and those mistakes. But uh, it is one of the issues that you have, right? When you talk to a Calvinist, right, everything that Paul did was predetermined by God. It was all within God's will, right? Uh, even when Paul says, I shouldn't have done that, right? Or even when Paul makes statements like, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you now, right? Well, what do you think that means? That means that Paul said, this is, I'm not, this is not the, the Holy Spirit speaking. I'm just telling you what I think, uh, right? This is how I would handle it. And so and Calvinists obviously have some issues with that kind of stuff. But coming into verse number 8, he says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, uh, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many uh, adversaries. Right? And so uh, Paul makes a statement that he's, he's prioritizing one thing over another. Right? So what is he doing? He's prioritizing going and reaching uh, unreached people with the gospel rather than spending time uh, with them uh, because he says, right now that door's open, and I don't know how long that door will stay open, right? Uh, and so he's telling them, listen, I've got an opportunity. I need to seize that opportunity. I need to take that opportunity uh, uh, as long as it is, uh, as, as long as it's before me, right? Um, William Arthur Ward made the statement, opportunities are like sunrises. If you wait too long, you'll miss them, uh, right? And so... That is what Paul is saying here. This is not Paul blowing them off, right? But as you go throughout life, like, you've got to prioritize some things in life. There's no way to make it your way through life without it, right? Uh, we do it both consciously and we do it subconsciously, right? You make a thousand uh, decisions to prioritize every day without even thinking about it, right? Right? Um, you get out of bed and, right, you immediately begin to prioritize, right? And so uh, you, you prioritize one thing over another thing, right? Brushing your teeth first or, right, going to the bathroom first or, right, starting the coffee maker first or whatever, right? But you probably, you're just constantly prioritizing. That is the way that, this said that your brain works, right? In the conscious world, right, we prioritize as well. Sometimes we have to look at situations in our lives as Christians and say, this is more important than this, right? And reaching, this, reaching an unreached group of people or reaching unbelievers is more important than me just simply teaching, right? Or instructing somebody who already believes. Uh, that does not mean, right, that... Uh, that that is all there is to the Christian life, right? Is to, well, we should just reach the unreached, and we, there's no need for discipleship or any of the other stuff, right? And oftentimes people can kind of fall into that. And I don't think we necessarily fall into it as far as what we believe, but often we fall into it um, in our action, right? Uh, and so we'll, we'll often fall into that, right, of I'm just going to worry about reaching people and reaching people and reaching people, but you do have to, Disciple people too, right? And so both things are important. And Paul is not saying uh, here that he's not going to disciple him them. He's just saying at this point in time, I have a door that is open that is not going to remain open, and so I need to take the opportunity while the opportunity is before me to go and to reach these people. Uh, and so I would say, I guess the way probably that I would break all that down. Right, is to say that, uh, right, if you only have one opportunity to reach a person, right, and you have to choose between reaching that person, right, or doing a Bible study with somebody, go reach that person, right? But if you can reach that person tomorrow and you can do the Bible study today, right, or you can do the Bible study tomorrow, you can reach that person today, whatever it might be, right? just properly prioritize, right? Uh, and I think the Holy Spirit uh, works in that way, right, in our lives if we're attentive to Him and we're discerning about things. Uh, I think the Holy Spirit works in that way uh, and, uh, and 
helps us to prioritize things properly. Then verse number 10 and 11, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. <clears throat> Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him uh, with the brethren. All right, so here is uh, some interesting right, wording by Paul concerning how some of these people felt about Timothy. Um, and uh, apparently people didn't like Timothy because he was young, right? And Paul, may, I think yeah, if you take uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, you'll see that to be true. Uh, they didn't like Timothy because he was young, uh, but obviously led him, led them to act out against him in such ways that Paul says, hey, I need you guys to conduct him in peace, right? Like make sure he makes it through there without... All right, somebody being a knucklehead and doing something stupid uh, is basically what Paul says. Uh, there's a there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Uh, I won't per I, I would not uh, I wouldn't make an accusation against Timothy, but I can speak for myself, right? In my younger years, um, right? Youth has a certain brashness and boldness to it um, that doesn't always lend itself uh, to to people feeling the best about the individual, right? Uh, and that may be what was true with Timothy, right? That Timothy was just a little brash, right? He was a little unpolished uh, in, in these things and uh, was willing maybe to confront things and not confront them always with the most grace, right? And so uh, so Paul says, hey, right, he's he's good for you, right? He says, let him be there without fear. He says, because he is doing the work of the Lord. He says, he's doing the same work I'm doing. All right, so make sure that he's, that he's all right, that you guys take care of him. Uh, right? And, so, and that may have to do with the fact that Timothy was young and traveling by himself. Uh, right? Or traveling as a young person, even with others. Right? You, uh, this was not a time when right, you, we travel like we do now. Right, a lot of this travel took place on foot. Thieves were a real issue. Bandits and roving band, uh, bands of uh, these bandits and such were uh, all over the place. Right, so there was some of that that went along with it. Right, don't let Timothy sleep in the street. Basically, uh, right, make sure to take care of him. Uh, is uh, is Paul's what Paul says to him? Right, uh, and so certainly some of it is got to do with his youth. Right. Uh, he says, but I'm going to be looking for him, right? He says, so you guys better make sure that he, that he makes it, right? Uh, the Richard Branson, who's uh, owned uh, Virgin uh, Airlines and such, made the statement, right? Respect is uh, how to treat everyone, not just, how, not just those that you want to impress, right? And that is Paul's statement really to them, right? Treat Timothy with some respect, right? Give him the respect that you would give me because he's doing the same work that I'm doing. Sometimes that's hard to do, right? Uh, it's difficult to do that. It, and it's difficult sometimes to give young Christians and new Christians a grace that they need uh, to grow, right? You want somebody to believe and you want them to, 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 to have all the same standards and right conduct that you have, uh, even though your standards and your conduct, you can't hardly keep up with, right, 90% of the time. Uh, I was just actually having this conversation with, uh, with a buddy of mine today, because we were talking about, uh, there's a girl that used to do uh, unacceptable things, right, online for money, uh, right? She had an OnlyFans account. She made a lot of money doing it, over $9 million. Uh, but apparently she's converted, and so uh, she she is, uh, far as I can tell, right, she's claiming the name of Christ, and uh, she's getting a lot of hate from both sides for her, right? Uh, same thing happened when uh, I talked about Kat Von D before, who used to be on uh, LA Inc., which was a show about tattoo artists, and she's, you know, she she's still, she's saved, but, uh, you know, she continues, she dresses gothic and stuff like that, and uh, a lot of people give her a lot of, you know, a lot of grief over it, um, right? Sometimes it's hard to give young Christians the grace to grow, 
right? To reach the same uh, conclusions that you've reached. And sometimes it's hard to give them the grace to reach different conclusions than you've reached, right? Not everything uh, that we do in our Christian lives is always 100%, uh, right? Just us being, being right. right. You're not right about everything you believe. You're not right about all, every standard you have. Right? And that doesn't mean that you're wrong about everything either. In some cases, right, you've got to have grace for them. Sometimes you need grace for yourself. Right? I look back over my life, that's probably uh, one of my biggest issues over the course of my life has been that, uh, that I don't have a lot of grace for me. Uh, right? When I was younger, I didn't have a lot of grace for others either. Uh, right? But don't have a lot of grace for me. And so, uh, right, when you fumble the ball, man, you beat yourself up pretty good about it, right? And it's hard to stay on track or even get back on track, right? And so, uh, but Paul tells them here, right, make sure that Timothy through there, right, safely. You see, while he's there, he's doing the same work I'm doing, he tells him. Verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come up with the brethren, but his will was not at all uh, to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. Uh, Paul's wording uh, can sometimes be a little interesting, right? But he, say, he uses that convenient time, right? He'll come when, he's, when it's convenient for him. Uh, there, you can have a couple of right, different opinions about, uh, about the statement. Maybe this shows that uh, the leaders of the early church had friction between them, right? And Paul said, I wanted Apollos to come. Apollos said he's not going to come. He said it's not convenient for him right now, right? Uh, maybe this, though, shows, uh, I think, more importantly than that, right? I think it shows the autonomy that the early church leaders had uh, to, to reach and minister to the people that they felt they needed to reach and minister to. Uh, and there is an autonomy in... Uh, in Christianity, right? Not only for leaders, obviously, but for, uh, for believers as well, right? Uh, it's not, we're not all locked in, right? We, we don't all march in lockstep and act the same and do the same, right? Um, it's, it, it's sometimes, it can be disconcerting sometimes, right? Uh, I enjoy going to a, uh, to big meetings, right, with, uh, with pastors and stuff like that. But it can be a little odd sometimes, right, that you get in that building and you, you can't hardly tell one from the other, right? I mean, if you were standing at the back of that building, you wouldn't be able to tell one person from the other. They all have the same haircuts, right? They all wear the same type of suits, right? I mean, it's very, you know, and my rebellion against that, obviously, was to wear zoot suits and such. Um, and so, uh, right, I, I, I've never been one that wanted to fit in. Uh, I don't want to fit in now, right? Um, and I'm not saying that's always a good thing, right, that it's a spiritual, right, that's not some spiritual attribute that I have, you know, uh, that I'm, I'm a rebel for Jesus, you know. Uh, no, I'm a rebel for Nathan, but, um, right, but, but that, there, that should cause us some pause from time to time, right? It should cause you to pause from time to time. And re-examine what you believe, right? What you read, what you're thinking, and how you're seeing a passage, right? You should take a step back from time to time. And it's hard to do away with your presuppositions about what a passage says. But you should be honest with the book, right? And do your dead level best to examine it without all the noise, right, of everybody else's opinions. Just what does this say, right? And what is it? How? Who is God speaking to in this passage, right? What is He trying to tell them, and how does that apply in our present period of time, right? Like you need to be able to do that, right? You, Apollos said, Paul said, Apollos, I want you to go down and see the folks in Corinth, and Apollos said, I don't have time, and Paul's statement to the Corinthians was not. That knucklehead Apollos, he's not going to come down there, right? Paul says he'll make it, right? It's just not convenient for him right now. Uh, Paul, Paul had grace. 
sometimes you get the idea, right, that Paul was some kind of pope of the early church. He was not. That concept is incorrect. He was certainly a leader of the early church, and he certainly had a powerful influence uh, right over the doctrine of the early church. But the fact that we have so many schisms even today tells you that Paul only had influence and he was not in full control of everything that the early churches were doing. Uh, right? I mean, you look at Catholicism, right? Catholicism has its roots in our same Christian history. It's back there, right? But it, ha it took its own path. That was certainly not, Catholicism was certainly not what Paul was preaching, and it wasn't what Peter was preaching, right? Despite what the Catholics would have you to believe, right? But it wasn't what Peter was preaching. But there was obviously, right, leadership within the early church that, was, that had autonomy and was doing its own thing. That autonomy is important. We believe it's important as Baptists. We, that's one of our distinctives, is we believe in the autonomy of the local church that it doesn't fall under some umbrella. It would be foolish for us to act like going back that somehow the churches fell under Paul's umbrella. Why, if that was true, why would Paul have to be talking to the church in Corinth like he's talking to the church in Corinth? Why wouldn't he just say, you know what, you bunch of knuckleheads, you guys are all out. I'll just start a new, whole new thing. But that's not what he says. He's trying to win them over to his, to his side. Right? When you read Romans, you read Corinthians, you read Paul's writings, Paul is making a plea to those early believers. He's trying, to, he, he's trying to get them to see his point of view and see why his point of view is right. Right, But you find very few points, I can only really think right off the top of my head of maybe one or two, but you find very few points where Paul is emphatic Right? Where he gives a command, this is the command, right, that I'm giving to you. There's a couple of them, uh, but most of the time Paul is trying to win them, right, because of that autonomy. Uh, and I think autonomy is still important in the church even now. <clears throat> verse number 15 and verse number, or I'm sorry, verse number 13 and 14. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Right? That, uh, that quits you like men. Right? We, uh, there's an awful lot of messages that are preached about quit you like men. Uh, right? That basically sound exactly like this. Men don't quit. Hallelujah. Praise God. Right? But that's not what that phrasing meant. Right? What it meant basically, right, was stand up and be counted. Right? Take a stand for what you believe in. Uh, right? Bow your back. That's, that's what it meant, right? When he says, watch, stand fast, right? Bow your back. Don't give in. That's what it meant to quit you like men. Right? Bow your back. Make, make it known that you're, this, is, this is your side. Right? This is where you stand. Uh, right? Uh, I think it's... Uh, but it Martin Luther, right, that made the statement, uh, right? Here I stand, I can do no other, uh, right? And that is what quit you like men meant, right? I don't agree with Luther on a lot uh, of stuff, but, uh, right? But that is what that, that quit you like men meant, right? And he tells them, and be strong about it, right? It, it, you look at the, the first part of that, right? And you say, yeah, right? Bow your back, right? Push back, take a stand, all that kind of stuff. But then he says what? Do it all how? Do it with charity, right? Don't be a jerk for jerk's sake, right? You can, you can do all this, Paul says, and you can still do, do it from a place of love. It's fine to take a stand if you want to take a stand from a place of love. Most people will accept and respect uh, and honor, even if, they don't, even if they don't give in, right? They can accept and honor that you're taking a stand with charity. 
a lot of times that's not the way that we come across, right? And I say we don't come across that way because I don't think we intend to come across that way. I think we intend, right? That's some of the issue that I have with a lot of the stuff you hear in our present period of time, transgenders and wokeism and right, all this other stuff. It's not coming from a place of charity. Right? Uh, we, uh, we like to watch American Idol, right? Uh, because we're idolaters. So, uh, but we like to watch American Idol, right? We like singing and we like music. Uh, they had a kid on there this year that was from the Netherlands. Um, and very obviously has some severe mental health issues, right? Uh, one side of his hair is blue, one side is pink. He wore very flamboyant clothing, right? If you didn't know better, you would think that he was probably homosexual, right? And he may be, they, they never really addressed it, right? But uh, all of that, right? And I told my daughter, I said, what's really sad, right? And he, he had a good voice, he could sing. He, I did not think he was on par for the competition that he was up against, right? And so he, did, he didn't end up making it through. But, um, but I told Allison, I said, you know, the real issue is that he needs help. And instead of helping him, right, they're exploiting him for the sake of ratings, you know? And, uh, and oftentimes I think the same thing with a lot of the people who find themselves in a situation where they don't feel like they fit in the body that they've been given, right? Yes, there are some who do it strictly, right, uh, out, of, uh, out of hatred for all things normal, right? But there's an awful lot of them that just have a serious mental health issue. And rather than people finding them help, they validate their mental health issue instead of helping them. And none of that stuff helps. They don't get any better. It doesn't solve the problem. And that's why so many of them still continue down the same path and end up committing suicide right, end up dying as a result of the surgeries and everything else that they're, that they're put through or the medications that they're on and these types of things because they had a mental health problem and nobody wanted to address the mental health problem. And uh, so, right, all things that we do ought to be done with charity. Right, take a stand. It's fine to say, listen, we're not for that stuff, but we are for you getting the help you need and whatever small part we can play in that, we will do what we can, right? Listen, the world, is, the world is full of hate. It's got plenty of it. Doesn't need us to contribute to it, right? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't hate sin or any of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm saying, right? But the world's got plenty of hate. And you won't find where we've been told that we should hate everybody. Right? We're told, hey, you should not, don't fall in love with this world. Right? If you love this world, you do hate some things, right? And oftentimes we automatically turn that around and we say, therefore, if you love Jesus, you hate everybody that's in the world. Right? We don't phrase it that way. What we say is, well, you got to hate the world, right? Uh, and that's fine if what you mean by hate the world is hate the sin right? But oftentimes it doesn't end up with us hating the sin, right? And a Calvinist will tell you, right? If you listen to, to a Calvinist, they will tell you straight up, right? God hates sinners, uh, right? And they'll say, see, he's angry with the wicked every day. It's a big stretch between angry with the wicked every day and hates sinners, right? Uh, so anyways, I get angry at my kids doesn't mean I hate them, right? There's a big difference. Uh, anyway, so uh, he says, uh, verse 15 and 16 here. Let's see if I can get through this. Verse 15 and 16. Uh, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth us and laboreth, Right? Paul says, listen, he says these people were addicted, right, to, to the ministry, right? They were addicted to helping others, 
If you got to have an addiction, man, there's a good one to have, right? Paul says, listen, they were, they were all in, right? He says, listen, you ought to help anybody that's helping, right? I mean, get involved with anybody that's getting involved, right? He says, these people labored together with them, right? Uh, I don't obviously agree with Mahatma Gandhi, right? Uh, but I, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi said, right, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service to others, which is right in line, right, with what Christ says. What does it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul, right? Uh, listen, I, don't, I, I think you ought to lose yourself in service to others. I just don't think you ought to lose yourself in service to others for the sake of yourself, right? You do it for the sake of Christ. We serve others for Christ. We serve others because it is our way of serving Christ. What did Christ tell the disciples? And as much as you've given, right, you give a, a glass of a, a drink of water to one that is thirsty, right? You give food to one that is hungry. You visit one that's in prison. You've done it to me, Christ said. Isn't it amazing, right, some of the things that we never hear messages preached on versus some of the things we do? Right, there's a, listen, and I'm not, right, but if you just, right, you Google five minutes, right, you can find a hundred messages against homosexuality, right, or a hundred messages against alcohol or whatever, right? Just try and find a hundred messages on serving others. Right, it's, it's, not, it's not as simple, and I'm not saying they're not being preached, Right. I listened to, I sat last night on my couch and listened to Brother uh, Trever at North Valley, right, in Santa Clara. Um, I sat on, my, uh, sat on my couch last night and listened to him preach, right? And his whole message was, listen, man, church, he says, man, church is where it's always been, right? He says, I want to be here. And he says, I want to be here because I want to help others. Right, and that is, uh, that is what it is, right, that Paul is talking about even to this church here, uh, right? He tells them uh, they should not have an unhealthy, right, uh, dependence on those outside of the church, but those inside should be addicted to helping others, right? He says verse 19 there in verse, uh, I think that's right. Actually, no, yeah, 17, I'm sorry, 17 and 18. He says, I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortuitus uh, and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Right? He says, listen, he says, I'm glad they're coming. Right? He says, some of that which, right, not because they didn't want to supply, but they just didn't have the ability to supply. Right? Paul says, hey, they're going to make that part up. You know what it tells you? It tells you this thing's a group effort. We ain't on our own out here. Listen, hey, we're a small church, right? But even as a small church, we ain't on, we're not on our own. In fact, the truth is, as a small church, we're in the majority, not the minority. There's more little churches like this than there are big churches like right, Harvest and these others. We're not in the minority and we're not alone, right? And sometimes that's the way that, right, it's, you, you start to feel, right, well, you know, we're just small and we're all alone and it's just us. And No, listen, God's got a thousand, right, servants just like us all over the city of Riverside, right? He's got hundreds of thousands of them all over the state of California, without a doubt, millions of them all over the state, all over the country, right? God's got plenty. We're not alone. We're not doing anything on our own, Right? And all God wants us to do is what we can do. He says, hey, don't worry about it. Stephanus, Fortuitous, right, Achaeus, don't worry about it. They'll make up whatever you're lacking. You know what God says? Do what you can do. I've got somebody else that'll make up what you can't do. Right? You don't have to do it all. You just got to do what you're supposed to do and do what you can do. If you'll do what you can do, God's got somebody that can make up the difference. Right? You don't have to do it all, he says. 
Uh, right, he says, verse 19 and 20, the churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet you one another with an holy kiss, he tells them uh, there, right? Listen, he talks about all these churches in Asia, right? Truth is, Asia used to be the hotbed of the gospel, right? It moved here, and it's moving back, by the way, right? Here and since, I mean, for a long time, but, but Asia is increasing on, the, on that front, right? But he talks about, man, listen, sometimes we get the idea, right, that, man, church has to be like this or like that. He says, no, nah, Aquila and Priscilla, they, they greet you with the church that's at their house. You know where church can be? It can be in a house, or church can be in a big building, right? Church can be at the park. Church can be wherever it is that the church gathers, right? It doesn't have to always fit into some kind of mold for those around. And sometimes we get the idea, well, they won't come if we don't have a building. They won't come if, well, who won't come? Lost people, sure, lost people won't come. But lost people weren't coming to church to begin with. Right? We're the ones, Christians get more tied up with that stuff than anybody else does. Right? We're more tied up with what the building looks like. Right? You get, you get a Christian move into town, come to your house church, right? He'll say, well, we need a church with more programs and this, that, and the other. You get somebody saved, man, they don't care where you're meeting, they just want to be a part. Right? I'm just saying, and that was what Paul says here about a, uh, about. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Then he says, <coughs> verse uh, 21 down through the end of the chapter, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul says, listen, he says, anybody that doesn't love Christ, he says, let him be anathema. Right? Push them away, Paul says. Right? If they don't love Jesus, what's interesting is he says, if they don't love Jesus, let them be anathema, which means basically let them be treated like an outsider. Right? Cut them off. Let them be just like somebody who's unsaved. And that's an interesting statement. You know why that's an interesting statement? Because he doesn't say if they don't love Jesus Christ, they're not saved. It's not what he says. He says, they don't love Jesus Christ. He says, let them be cut off. Right? He says, cease fellowship with them. Uh, right? Listen, if you stick around Christianity long enough, let me tell you what you're going to run into. You're going to run into some people who feel like God's done them dirty. They're just as saved as you are. They're just not in love with Christ anymore. It's the reason why, when you get into Revelation, right, the church is told what? You've lost your first love. What's that first love? Jesus Christ. What do you think that first love is, right? I've heard that first love explained as a thousand different things. The first love of the believer is their Savior, Jesus Christ. They lost it. They lost that first love. Right? Listen, yeah, if somebody doesn't love Jesus anymore... You should cut it off. It's not good. You ever run into somebody who's bitter? Forget bitter about Christianity. I mean, bitter about anything. Feel like they were done dirty when they're in high school, right? Got cut, you know, from uh, you know from their high school football team. They were going to be the star quarterback, whatever, right? They're bitter people. They're horrible. They're awful people to be around. It's tough to sit around with and talk with them. I feel that way when I get around people on either side, either extreme of the political parties, right? The people who are never Trumpers, right? I feel that's the exact same way about the people that are never Bideners, right? All they can talk about is, can you believe Biden did this? Can you believe if Biden had did this and Biden did that? Man, look, I don't want to talk about it, right? Not because I'm not, because I don't care what happens in our country or anything else, but you're not going to take them out of office. All right, so you better figure out how am I going to deal with what he's doing. All right, I feel the same way about the people who are never Trumpers. I'm like, good Lord, 
How in the world do these individuals live in your head rent free? Like, you can't do that. You just can't be that way. And people who have fallen out of love with Jesus Christ, they're like that. All they can talk about is how the church did them dirty. How something went wrong. How God didn't love them enough, right? Their Sunday school teacher, right, did this. Or their pastor did that, right? If you've ever met somebody, right, who was done dirty by a pastor, and now, man, they hate anything Christian whatsoever. 90% of the time, the preacher doesn't even know he did them dirty. Right? And he may legitimately have done the wrong thing. 90% of the time, he doesn't even know. The number of people that left churches that I helped Pastor Johnston with who hated Pastor Jay, and Pastor Jay had no clue. He didn't know they hated him, and he didn't know why they would hate him. Right? Not because Pastor Jay did everything right. Pastor Jay was nuts, man. Uh, he did some of the craziest stuff you've ever seen in your life. Right? But... It wasn't because he, Pastor Jay wouldn't, would never have done anything to hurt anybody or never have done anything, right? He never would have knowingly done that stuff, right? But not because he was perfect, but just because, like, he never came and sat down across the table and said, hey, look, here was the situation, here's what you did, right? Every, almost every pastor I know, I can probably think of a few that maybe not, but almost every pastor I know, if you sat down legitimately across the table from them and said, this really hurt me, like most of every pastor I know, they're in ministry because they love people. You know what they'd say? Man, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Right? I was never my intention. Right? But man, people fall out of love with Jesus Christ. Most of the time, the way they fall out of love with Jesus Christ is they fall out of love with what Jesus loves. Right? They fall out of love with the church. They fall out of love with other believers. Right? That's how you know they're out of love with Jesus Christ. Because if you love Jesus Christ, you know what you love? You love what he loves. You love the church. You love other believers. Even when they're crazy and they have weird beliefs, man. Right? I mean, I, you, if you've been around long enough, right, you've met a Christian who believes that, right, that they can speak in tongues or they can heal people, right? And they're genuinely some of the sweetest people you've ever met in your life. But that is crazy. But you know what? I love them. Right? I, obviously, I want them to have good doctrine. I'd rather them, right, read their Bible and see the truth. But, right? I mean, listen, if you love Christ, you love other believers. Even the ones that don't love you, you love them too. And that's what Paul tells this church they ought to do as well. Let's pray and we'll get out of here. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the Word of God. Thankful for the truth of the Word of God tonight. Pray, God, I've said what I should say. Pray, I've not said anything I should not. And I pray, God, you've been glorified by it now. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dis